the Bitcoin Group, the American original. For over the last 10 seconds, the sharpest Satoshis, the best Bitcoins, the hardest cryptocurrency talk. Issue one, Walmart and Bitcoin. If your Bitcoin is so great, why can't it be accepted in the real world? Is Bitcoin ready for the rigors of checkout? Customers use their credit cards and enjoy near instantaneous transactions. Why would they wait for Bitcoin when they can soon push their carts full of RFID chips across a scanner, a process that will transform checkout? What is the future of this Bitcoin in brick and mortar retail? I ask you, Andreas Antonopoulos. I, I don't think people will use Bitcoin to buy stuff at Walmart, not for a very long time. It's, uh, it's not ready. The infrastructure isn't there. The point of sale systems aren't there. The corporate uh, structures aren't there. The legal systems aren't there. It's going to take a long time until you can pay for your groceries at Walmart with Bitcoin. And even if that time comes, it's probably going to be more like a loyalty card, so you sign up for it in advance, rather than a instantaneous cash-like transaction, which is ad hoc. So, no, nah, it's going to be a while. Derek J. I disagree strongly with Andreas. I think it's uh, just around the corner. In nine months, mm -hmm. there will be a release of a new app for Google Glass called Glass Pay, which allows users, among other things, to uh, go shopping in a regular retail store and scan the UPCs of their items with their eyes or their phone and uh, pay with Bitcoin without even waiting in a line. So uh, their advantages are obvious. People prefer to use the self-checkout. This uh, removes just one more layer of the payment process. So it's only a, a matter of time, and I think that time is quick. Davi Barker. I'm in uh, the middle of the road here. I, uh, I, I think Andreas is right. I think technologically we're not there. I think Derek is right. I think the innovations are right around the corner. It's just a matter of demand. If it becomes something that there is a strong demand for, someone will design the software and the hardware and it'll happen. And um, right now there isn't. Right now it seems like Bitcoin mostly lives online, and that's okay. And, Jace, you seem to disagree with Derek there. Well, I'll, I'll just, I'll just uh, go launch on a tangent. The real question we should be asking ourselves is, does Walmart deserve our money, or should it go down in a ball of flames and smoky fire because every single purchase you make at that pit hole of hell <laughs> is subsidized by taxpayers to pay for welfare for everybody working there because they don't get a living wage. So, should so they get our Walmart. Bitcoin? Probably not. I'd rather like to disrupt and disintermediate Walmart whole out of existence altogether. How about we throw out brick and mortars? What if Bitcoin is too cool for brick and mortar stores and they just become completely irrelevant in the new economy? It seems uh, like that's happening already with uh, Best Buy becoming really more of a warehouse where you go and look at things, then go home and buy them on Amazon.com. Well, uh, it's becoming even more prevalent with the discovery of 3D printers as 3D printers move from the consumer, uh, from the commercial market into homes. Uh, we're going to see more and more people not even needing to go out to a brick and mortar store. Certainly, they can pay for their designs in bitcoins. They can pay for the ma the machine and the materials in bitcoins. So, uh, the the end of brick and mortar. I think Davi's right. <laughs> it's just around the corner. Issue two, Amazon.com. Amazon.com is the world's o largest online retailer with their amazing e-marketplace that literally sells everything from books to the kitchen sink, but they don't take bitcoins. eBay, the world's largest online auction place, also says no. Why haven't these internet giants bent their knee to your almighty bitcoin? And when will they? Why haven't they yet? And what's stopping them? I'm looking at you, Derek J. Uh, well, it's obvious. Uh, okay, so Amazon does accept Bitcoin, and I've used Bitcoin uh, through Amazon um, to purchase not only the microphone that I'm using now, but the, the mixer that I'm using, um, the, the jacket and shirt that I wear, all of these things I'm able to purchase through Amazon uh, using just another app. Uh, Gift is one, but it's not the only one. GYFT is an app that people can use on your standard smartphone and use that to go from bitcoins on your phone to clothes on your body and uh, it's it is possible to use bitcoin in those major uh, stores you can even purchase a victimless crime spree uh, at amazon using bitcoins i want to make the same argument for ebay uh... i have an ebay account and i sell 
products on eBay, and eBay doesn't accept Bitcoin, but all of my eBay listings have links to my BitMit account, and my BitMit account does take Bitcoin. So if a person is surfing eBay and they see my product and they want to pay with Bitcoin, it's just one button. So, <laughs> I mean, we're, we're essentially these guys don't have to, they don't have to play along. We're going to work around whatever their policy is anyway. Andreas Antonopoulos, is it three no's? Is the questioner all wrong? When you have money that can be routed, that money can be routed around problems. Davi made an excellent point. And it's essentially the fact that you can route Bitcoin that allows you to do that, that it's extremely fungible and frictionless. So let's, uh, let's look at the uh, grand defamation of Bitcoin by Amazon.com and eBay. There are 192 currencies in the world, and Amazon and eBay accept maybe three dozen of them. So where are the other 160 outraged currencies clamoring <laughs> for a defamation suit against Amazon.com and eBay.com? Where are the 130 countries where you can't buy crap from either of those con con uh, companies because they can't ship it to you? They also can't ship to uh, PO boxes, AFOs, AFPs, and various other three-letter acronyms. The point is here that this is a first world currency problem. Amazon.com and eBay.com sell exclusively to a very, very narrow part of the North American continent and the North European continent in a handful of currencies. So let's join the other slighted currencies and sue. Man, Bitcoin versus we Amazon. Amazon. <laughs> I have to mention uh, that about a year ago, BitcoinStore.com made headlines when it challenged Amazon.com, eBay, and some others to start accepting Bitcoin and that they would close down. And they said, we will stop taking your millions of dollars from customers from you and shut down tomorrow if you'll start accepting Bitcoin. They haven't raised to that uh, challenge yet, but I think the offer's still on the table and they, they should absolutely take advantage of it. Hey, if we started having success in all of these fields, we wouldn't have a Bitcoin industry. Every single one of the businesses in the Bitcoin industry today is a bridge business, a business that could easily be eclipsed if any one of the really big businesses already in that space just said, hey, Bitcoin, let's do it. Boom, all of the exchanges disappear. Boom, all of the trading houses disappear. All of the banks, all of the wallets. We don't need those things because they don't exist in the real world. We need those things because where they do exist in the real world, A, they suck, and two, they don't take Bitcoin. So we can simultaneously fix both of those problems in one go. We can make them take Bitcoin, but we can also make services that don't suck in the first place. And those take Bitcoin by default, of course. Andreas makes an excellent point when he says that they suck. I mean, if you look at eBay, eBay used to be a fantastic sort of free market on the internet and used to be almost like a garage sale. And now it's very, it's very sort of, I mean, it feels more like a shopping mall. There's a lot more restrictions on you as a merchant if you want to sell. There's a lot more fees. Um, they operate through PayPal, which has a lot of tax problems. So it seems like these firms, they get big and then they get cumbersome. Even if they started taking Bitcoin, I might still prefer my sort of like niche market sort of Bitcoin native applications. You know when I started getting excited about eBay again? When they renamed themselves to Silk Road and ran a really nice frictionless market for a very long time. Unfortunately, <laughs> that branch of eBay shut down, so now we're stuck with the bad old eBay. You I'd know, like to see more of, innovation on that end. Speaking of Silk Road, do you think, I mean, I realize that Silk Road is in, a, is in an ambiguous place right now, but do you think that Silk Road could legitimately challenge Amazon's claim to being the largest marketplace online? I think a peer-to-peer -peer marketplace could easily succeed in challenging any centralized marketplace and being the biggest one online if it was allowed to. Um, but it will get regulated out of existence. Here's the thing. If you, go on, if you went on Silk Road when it was still open and you looked at all the products they offered, what surprised me the most was that while drugs were a big part of it, they weren't the only thing on offer there. You could buy a lot of very interesting, legitimate products from uh, Bitcoin badges to T-shirts to brochures to uh, whatever you might, little tchotchkes here and there. All of these available. Why? Because it was a very large, flexible, and fluid market. So it succeeded as a marketplace first. And I'd like to see some of these legacy um, businesses be disrupted at their base operational model, not at picking the right currency, but at delivering the right service to customers. Bitcoin should be an after effect.
to the degree that Silk Road was as successful or more successful than Amazon.com or will be in the future, I think uh, it's clear that the next incarnation of the Silk Road will be even more powerful, even uh, more user-friendly, and uh, will over overtake uh, the, the record set by the first Silk Road. And so it's only a matter of time as this train keeps rolling and uh, markets get... Uh, more and more frictionless, I like to, to borrow a term from Andreas. If I had to guess, between the FBI having struck a permanent and crippling strike against the war on drugs, or simply created the next Silk Road 2 clone with a few weeks and a code bounty, I'd go for the latter. I think it's more than one. I, don't, I think there's <laughs> going to be more than one Silk yep. Road clone. I mean, there's more, than one, there's more than one Liberty Dollar clone after Liberty Dollar got shut down. I mean, that's not what happens when you when you when you sh when the, when they shut down one like free market in demand product. People learn from not the mistakes per se, but they learn from the strategy that the government used to shut them down. And then everybody tries twelve new strategies. Here's so, the thing: they don't get every attack by a government against a distributed peer-to-peer -peer system is like a failed dose of antibiotics. You will kill the weakest organisms and you will allow the strongest to thrive. That you will select through evolution metaphor. the exact clones, whether those are altcoins or peer-to-peer -peer file sharing capabilities or silk roads that can resist your particular strain of statist um, bio uh, problem. So if you start attacking these services, all you're doing is help them evolve you're to be attack them, yeah. proof. Well, and thinking back to what Andreas was describing with the marketplace they developed and how it was frictionless, what I was thinking about what's lost is the reputation system. That yep. they had a, a reputation system yeah. going on there. If that could have been separated from the Silk Road, been its own generic reputation system, that could have been used for additional Silk Roads down the line and other websites. Do you think only failed. accepting Bitcoin was a was a, a hurdle for for Silk Road? Do you think Silk Road would have been a more fluid marketplace if any sort of currency could be exchanged? I think there are a lot of people who use the Silk Road who would have preferred to trade in precious metals or other sorts of um, alternative currencies that are not Bitcoin. I think they'd open themselves up to more attacks if they had expanded into areas that are more easily regulated. You see, the thing with every one of these attacks against Bitcoin businesses, what we see is the complete lack of tools that the government has to carry out these attacks. If they could attack Bitcoin, they'd attack Bitcoin. They can't. All the tools they have are for regulating fiat, so all the attacks they can bring to bear are on the fiat exits and entries into these systems. So if I've these systems had more fiat, time. they'd get hit even more. I say the problem with Bitcoin is dollars. I've said that. Yep. If you look at every every crash, every attack, every shutdown, it's it's always been it's always been on the fiat side of the transaction where the problem is. It's never on the Bitcoin side of the transaction. And and this is insanity because uh, take a real life metaphor. If we regulated aviation based on the ownership of the land where the airports are sitting, then we'd get their traditional competitors, land-based companies, complaining about this newfangled aviation and controlling it through the airports. Well, with Bitcoin, uh, Every time we try to land in another currency, we get hassled at customs. That's the only place they can control. So it's a bit yeah. like trying to regulate aviation through airports. And, you know, the best solution to that is never land. I mean, that's not that far-fetched. I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty interesting to think that, that those loops start getting closed when you start having, like, every level of the economy has some merchant somewhere who's interested in accepting Bitcoin. I mean, even real estate now, we have realtors taking Bitcoin. Well, that's one step away from farms accepting Bitcoin, and then you have a complete sort of a complete economy. Eventually, you won't ever need to cash out. And then what? Then what does the government do? They have to regulate corn. <laughs> they, have to, they have to get you at the point of sale, right? <laughs> at that point, they start taking Bitcoin for taxes if they're smart enough. That might be the end of them. Uh, it was my understanding that the government is already expecting to people to pay taxes on uh, revenue earned from the appreciation of the value of their bitcoins. Are In they dollars. accepting bitcoin? What if I don't have any dollars? No, they want you to change it back to dollars. So you can then blame Mount Gox for why you haven't paid your taxes for six months. I tried. They won't let me withdraw. Has, has that ever been done to any other currency? That you're forced to change the currency to pay the taxes? 
Yeah. Every currency in the world is based on forcing you to change to it to pay the taxes. That's how national sovereign currencies gain their value uh, through the monopoly on the demand side from government. So the threat that they see from Bitcoin is wholly new. This new multinational, not even national currency. Well, it's, one it's of the, the native currency of the internet. That's what it is. Right, and one of the advantages of Bitcoin uh, that I know is familiar to this group is that uh, it can be taken across borders without having to be claimed. Typically, if you're bringing cash along with you, uh, crossing an imaginary line, you know, called a, a state border, um, those dollars or um, yuan or whatever it is, pieces of paper that you're holding, have to be. Um, registered or at least uh, no, you have to notify the, the people uh, when you're traveling if it's more than a certain quantity. That's not the case with Bitcoin and that's, that's going to cause a lot of disruption with reporting if people choose to do that. The, the form says cash and cash-like instruments. It doesn't say memorize sequences of brain wallet keys. <laughs> that's right and uh, since they are uh, Bits of information, as you point out, Andreas, it's almost a free speech issue as well, whereas the, the state, uh, no matter what state it is, has no inherent right to uh, tell people to say or <laughs> produce any certain uh, writing or materials. So it's, it's a little bit fuzzy with Bitcoin. Uh, is it money or is it speech? Well, depending on what you want to do with it at a certain time, uh, it could be either. Well, that Are sounds like passwords. I mean, that sounds like exactly the problem that you have with passwords, where when you're going through a checkpoint or whatever and they want to, like, search your laptop or search your phone, there are various levels of security and warrants that they need to demand your password, and um, you can be legally obligated to supply your password, supposedly. So, in I mean, countries, isn't, isn't that in the a, U.S. That, that seems like it would be a free speech issue the same, the same way. How can you obligate me to give you this alphanumeric code that opens up information on my hardware. Well, even better, actually, under the U.S. law, that falls squarely under the Fifth Amendment right to avoid incriminating yourself through testimony. So revealing your password can be very easily um, extrapolated to be incriminating information if that leads to all of the transactions that you've ever done. So you can very validly claim a Fifth Amendment right to remain silent. And I believe that's what's going on with the... Uh... Ross Albright case right now. Correct. They're not sure if he's going to give up his passwords, be forced to give up his passwords, or we don't know. Well, the I would like to. Uh, of the United States is one that makes no qualms about having tortured people in the past and continuing to torture people today. Wouldn't surprise me if they use torture against an individual to get their money out of them. Very possible, but. Um, at the same time, it's harder to do if you have a public profile or you're in the federal court system as Ulrich is. Here's what I have to say to the FBI. You keep using the word seized. I don't think the word seized means what you think it means. <laughs> that was exactly... I was utterly confused by the Silk Road coverage because it kept saying they seized Bitcoin. And every time I read it, I'm like, what does this mean? I read through like 12 articles and I'm like, what do they mean they seized Bitcoin? <laughs> like, did they take his server? Did they take his phone? Did they take his keys? Did they? What did they do? And it turns out they actually transferred them somewhere. But that doesn't... That doesn't... Like, that doesn't mean... That's not what seized means when I read it in the story. Well, that's not what seized means for the FBI either. The way the FBI seizes money in a bank account is by sending the bank a letter and says, we have seized, and that's it. It's a legal construct, not a technological or practical construct. So when they say we have seized, they mean we have legally declared this money seized, they and to um... take it from us would be illegal. Um, but, you know, in Bitcoin, all that means is that you're one transaction away, which can originate anywhere in the world for that money to be unseized, which would make for the most embarrassing fiasco for the FBI in decades, which I would welcome. That's what uh, I was disappointed about, that Albright didn't have a, a time lock or a poison pill, so that if he didn't check in every couple of days, that his money would be spread out to Greenpeace or Bitcoin. Well, maybe he does. Off. We Maybe don't know that. The only money crossed. that they have claimed to seize is the hot wallet, which contained 2,600 Bitcoin. They haven't seized the 80 million or so, which was his personal funds. That hasn't been moved at all. And so, presumably, that's still out there. I actually managed to get the Guardian newspaper to issue a retraction on one of their articles because they had said that this money cannot be spent now that the FBI controls the keys. 
And, um, and then they also said uh, they had to admit that they don't know if Ulrich has accomplices on the outside, which is the other big gap, right? Anyone else can do it. It certainly seems like it's a very large operation to be run by one man from his laptop near a coffee shop. And I'm waiting for the day when they tell us he was plan. working for the FBI. I'm sure those articles are out there if you look for them. But it just it seems obvious that he should have a contingency plan. You know what I mean? Like, he knew that he was engaged in, in a, in a quote-unquote illegal operation. Why wouldn't he have, have laid some groundwork to prepare in the event of being shut down? Well, he was operating within the U.S. I think that uh, gives us uh, the information we need to know that he wasn't uh, operating with the most paranoid state uh, that he could have been. Uh, because surely running an operation like this, uh, the United States is the last place that he would want to be. Uh, but that didn't matter to him. So but he didn't take every precaution. That's I think so the fundamental failing of the Silk Road was that they didn't have a button where you could flag other users as narcs. Otherwise, they would have found them by now. Why wouldn't that be abused if there was a button? If there was a button you could flag people as narcs, why wouldn't people just flag people they didn't like as narcs? Because everybody would be flagged, and that goes to my basic point, which is the Silk Road was a honeypot full of narcs at the end of the day. But but now we have this guy who goes into the honeypot full of narcs, runs it and does it from his home on his laptop. Like, what kind of a mindset does he get to not be paranoid? Like, where could he develop that? I mean, we Being have in his uh, early Snowden 20s. Lee, by the way. There is one yeah. explanation that we haven't explored. They got the wrong guy. It wouldn't be the first time. It seem likely. The, the facts of the story seem to indicate that they did get the right person. Have I heard any... Have I, anyone heard anything contrary to that? The facts of the story were written entirely in press releases by the prosecutors. There have been no independently corroborated facts other than those. So, of course, that does support the prosecutorial story. But we really don't know anything beyond that. They have very sparingly used the word allegedly, which is only reserved for torturers nowadays. But um, they have prosecuted this person with a lot of claims, but not much evidence. Uh, you know, I'm excited. I think Silk Road is part of why Bitcoin is up, to tell you the truth. Um, when, when the story broke, Bitcoin tanked, and then it went right back up by the end of the day. That shows resiliency. So now that it's getting all this press, it's going to be mentioned in every article that the Silk Road is, is covered in. That means more people will be Googling it, more people will be interested, and they'll see that, it didn't, that this crash was a, a flash in the pan, and it's a strong currency. So that means that more people are going to be using it, and the price will go up. You know what they say about publicity? There's no such thing as bad publicity. You can say whatever the hell you want about me. Just make sure you spell my name right. So <laughs> all of that two weeks of coverage, they spelled the name right. Give it three months, that'll be a $250 Bitcoin. Issue three, in Bitcoin we trust. Hard currency exists because of trust in precious metals. Fiat currencies exist because of trust in economic systems. Virtual currencies exist because of faith in mathematics, in cryptography we trust, or is this just another case of faith, like fiat, but this time with a digital god, rather than a federally reserved one? And what about the miners? You say there's no central bank, but I certainly see a cabal of miners. Davi Barker, your thoughts? Okay, so why are precious metals predictable? Precious metals are predictable because the laws of physics exist in nature. So why is Bitcoin predictable? Bitcoin is predictable because the laws of mathematics exist in nature. It's, 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 it's not tangible, but it is science. It's, it's a protocol, it's a program that is predictable. And that's fundamentally why gold and silver... Like, imagine for a moment... If gold was valuable because it had an industrial use, but it only worked 50% of the time, and that was like it was a totally like 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 variable as to whether or not gold was going to do what physics says it should do, it would no longer be valuable as a currency. It's the predictability, not necessarily the tangibility, that makes it valuable. Interesting, Derek J. Uh, I like the decentralized nature of Bitcoin. The fact that uh, individuals uh, including myself, are able to look at the code that people are working with, uh, suggest a different code, and uh, it's sort of a process of w what 
people think is uh, the, the right direction to take it, it gives me a, a lot more faith um, putting my trust in coders uh, rather than people who meet in secret rooms. Um, but th that the creation of Bitcoin and trust in it aside, uh, you mentioned the, a cabal of miners. Uh, when I think some people could uh, argue that there's a, a group of miners that uh, have more power than others, which is uh, uh, true when you add up all of their mining power, but I have a, a small mining rig here myself, and so I don't feel like uh, individuals can be t completely blocked out from participating in uh, Bitcoin mining. It, it's something that anyone can participate in, and uh, the, the, that fact m makes it more secure. Brief unwanted history lesson. In God We Trust was added in 1954 by an anti-communist crusader following the Joe McCarthyite uh, witch hunts or commie hunts in Congress. Before that, the national motto was a pluribus unum, out of many comes one. In God We Trust was added 22 years after the decline of the gold standard, and we switched our trust from gold to God, dropping an L, and as a result, our currency has devalued accordingly. Backing currency by fictional beings doesn't really help. A pluribus unum is a much better slogan because out of many comes one is the Bitcoin ethos. Bitcoin is, has emergent value that comes out of the collaboration of thousands of nodes, each offering their computational capability. Bitcoin is backed by the computational capability of the internet, a very tangible silicon-based system that is very effective as a store of value. So I prefer a pluribus unum from In God We Trust. It's just like the pledge, adding under God to the pledge was around the same time. Exactly the same time by exactly the same committee in Congress. So it's to, it's to fight godless communism. That's it was to fight godless communism, and before that, our national motto did not have any mention of God, just like speaking all of, of the other founding government documents. Speaking of mottos in money, some of the first motto on money in North America said, Mind your business. Um, that's really? that sort of, yes. that, that was Ben Franklin's mint, and he wrote, Mind your business on the back of the silver dollar, right? I, I like it both on, both on a message like mind your business and both on a like personal if you have a business you should be minding it that's your job right? <laughs> that's right I think that was the original meaning of the phrase back then yeah it know? wasn't so much on the harsh nature of it like shut your mouth it, it wasn't no the, that's don't tread on me different flag I'd like to see that on some currency what do you guys think of strength in numbers as the Bitcoin motto have you seen that around or as I would John like to... Gilmore once said, there is strength in numbers, large prime numbers. <laughs> I prefer to resurrect the mind your business motto. I think Bitcoin is a mind your business currency. It's one that you can attach an identity to or not. Uh, and it's one that uh, you can give to others or not. They can't take it from you in the same way that uh, cash can be taken or uh, digital money in your bank account. Out of compromise, why don't we go out of many comes one, the strength in numbers, and mind your own business. Issue four, Bitcoin mining. The ASIC revolution is clearly upon us. Since June of this year, having Bitcoin miners in your home has had the same value as space heaters in the summertime. Unless you've got the money for a $14,000 ASIC. Is the era of home mining over? I ask you, Andreas Antonopoulos. <laughs> No, it's only just beginning. We had to first completely eradicate the era of CPU mining and then destroy the era of GPU mining and then obliterate the era of FPGA mining. Each one of those was a 10x to 1000x increase in performance. But we've hit a wall. And that wall is silicon density and heat, uh, heat capacity, right? So from this point on, the only extra juice you can squeeze out of a system like that involves taking your design to a fab that can put it on a smaller die and uh, put more of it on a die. So you have to go from 28 nanometers to 20 nanometers, et cetera, et cetera, and keep scaling down. We're not going to see these enormous increases in hashing power in the next generations because we just squeezed out all of the low-hanging fruit in just six months. What that means is that now there is an industrial base for Bitcoin, uh, not just 
uh, consumer and crafts base. We actually have an industrial manufacturing base that is now being invested in to the tune of tens of millions of dollars for the production of ASIC fabs that will reach the hands of consumers. And that's a good thing. Derek J? It's unlikely, in my view, that anyone in the future will make a significant amount of money home mining. I'd leave that to the pros, but it's becoming more and more affordable and uh, easier to use. Uh, for example, I mentioned that I've got a couple of ASIC miners running behind me um, that are able to generate a couple of bucks in Bitcoin, and it's not substantial. Uh, it's not a substantial amount of money but I think it's worth it for the education and for the fact that it's very low power. Um, it, there's, it's a very low cost to me, but I appreciate being a part of the network and the fact that I'm able to mine, if not Bitcoin, something that perhaps is more valuable to me. Uh, just switch the use of these things over to a different uh, alternative currency and mine that. Uh, I don't care. I, uh, I, don't, I don't mine gold and silver in my house. I don't print Federal Reserve notes in my house. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm not really interested in mining, and I leave it to the experts. But something that occurs to me is uh, look at what the incentives have done. Like, if you look at the leap in processing power as a result of the incentives created by Bitcoin, that technology can now be used to process other things. You can take these processors and you can make... I have no idea what the computer industry will do with this technology, but you created the incentive for it, and suddenly we see light years leaped forward in processing power, and that's going to now be taken up by video games, by movie production companies, by who knows what they're going to use it for. Um, but that's, that's huge. That's a leap in, in technology. So I'm happy to see it, and I don't know how it works. I find it very promising because at the end of the day, this investment is a sunk cost and it is a sunk cost that is going to weigh like an anchor around the neck of everyone who entered Bitcoin as an early adopter and keep them in the game until we can get the mainstream involved enough. So I love this because all of this sunk cost means no one's exiting the mining business in a hurry anytime soon, and we're less likely to suffer from a dramatic collapse in hashing power that would lead to a uh, infinite block time completion. So I'm very happy about this. This wasted money has been wasted in creating a solid foundation for Bitcoin, and that's a great cause. Excellent analogy, Andreas. Wasted money, well worth wasting. I wonder if it, that's analogous with the gold rush, because if you think about like the like, California gold rush, everybody comes over here to get rich quick in the very beginning, but you know, a few years into it, after the sort of the gold, the sort of the, the flow of money has has sort of dribbled down, people have invested all this money in mining equipment. And that is also a sunken cost. And so they're going to look for other things to mine since they have the capital now. So I'm, I'm sort of curious whether or not you could actually look at them like literally analogously with the history of the gold rush. And even better yet, by the time they're finished with their mining gear, they look around them and guess what? There's a town, there's some roads, there's a railroad coming in, and all of that got paid for by the gold rush. So even while we're doing this, we're also paying for publicity for Bitcoin and marketing for Bitcoin and new exchanges for Bitcoin and all of the other infrastructure. So even when mining fails, the money that's been sunk in all of the auxiliary activities just from the publicity is generated will still be there. Some will turn into ghost towns, just like California, and some will turn into San Francisco. Yeah. I want to mention, while we're still on the topic of Bitcoin mining, how easy it can be to just plug in and unplug some of these uh, miners. Um, the equipment is incredibly easy and so replaceable. We're not talking about um, scales of difficulty like mining for gold where cranes are needed and drills. This is something as easy as plugging in a USB and downloading a program and letting it run. Uh, and it doesn't get any easier than that. And once your equipment becomes obsolete or outdated, it's easy enough to unplug a USB and plug in the new model. So I think we're going to see these things around for a long time, and I think we're going to see more democratization of mining as more and more people want to get involved at home. What I would like to see is some kind of a combination of uh, Bitcoin mining, Wi-Fi station, slash solar panel, where the panel itself could just take in the sun, transform it into Bitcoin, produce some Wi-Fi, Kind of an all three, maybe a lamp too. <laughs> well, merge, merged mining. 
merged mining is a really important topic from that perspective. Uh, one of the technologies developed over the last couple of years is the ability to do mining simultaneously for a number of different coins. So even if you're not productively mining Bitcoin, you can still productively mine a whole series of other altcoins, such as Namecoin or Devcoin or Primecoin, PPcoin, any other coin. Uh, you can actually go and merge mine other coins simultaneously and, and that will help promote the health of all of these other alt chains. Plus it gives you an early entry into some of the systems that haven't been heavily mined yet. I think there's a lot more to be covered on altcoins, but for now we're going to move on to predictions. This is the part of the show where I put you on the edge of your seat and ask you to predict something because you didn't read the setup document earlier. <laughs> Andreas Antonopoulos, prediction. Satoshi Nakamoto will be the world's first trillionaire. Davi Barker. We're running out of time. I think Bitcoin is going to save the third world. Derek J. Bitcoin will alleviate homelessness in the U.S. Online drug sites will continue to flourish. The FBI may have gotten one, but they'll never get them all. Controlling the internet is like a game of whack-a-mole. The moles keep popping up everywhere, and no matter how many you whack, they just keep coming back. Oops, we're out of time. Until next time, bye-bye. The Bitcoin Group, the American original. For over the last 10 seconds, the sharpest Satoshis, the best Bitcoins, the hardest cryptocurrency talk.